All right, so I said in the last video that I would make a follow-up sort of practice video. Hopefully this one's going to be shorter. I don't know if my voice can handle a much longer video. So I'm just going to try and offer a few, um, a few ways to practice the formal fallacies that we talked about in the, in the previous video. And uh, that's basically what we're going to do. Okay, so just getting down to it. Remember the difference between and and or. For and... Both sides have to be true for that statement to be true. So the example I have on this particular slide is Captain Picard. So if you don't know Star Trek The Next Generation, it's the guy I have laughing up in the top right. Captain Picard, uh, his T is Earl Grey and hot. Captain Picard's T is Earl Grey and hot. So what the and is doing there is it's basically saying that it's both Earl Grey and Dot. It has both of those qualities. So from premise number one, because those are conjoined with an and, what we can separate out from there, and this is called simplification, I didn't go into it last video, is Captain Picard's T is Earl Grey. And we can also separate out Captain Picard's T is hot. And that's because the and says that both sides are true. So anytime someone is saying that both things are true because they're using that conjunction and, you can take either one out separated from that complex statement. That's how and is, is sometimes used in logic. There's other ways, but again, this isn't a logic class, so I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to simplify. This is in contrast to or, where with or, at least one side is true, but you're not sure. Maybe both are in an inclusive or. Um, so my example sentence here is, I'm doing philosophy or engaging in brain rot. So uh, that could be uh, a, a, an either or case if it's an exclusive or. Um, or it could be that both are true at the same time, but we know at least one is true. So the way that that often gets used is in what we called a disjunctive syllogism or the process of elimination. So starting out with that singular sentence, I'm doing philosophy or engaging in brain rot. Premise number two, I'm not engaging in brain rot now. So I need one of those two things that are in that disjunction to be true. I said one is already not true. So that means that I'm left with as a conclusion that I'm doing philosophy now, okay? So ands, they join things, they both have to be true. For that reason, if you have a complex set of things joined by a conjunction, you can separate them out by a process called simplification. Um, and, and disjunctions, at least one has to be true. And if you eliminate pretty much all of the other options except for one, you know that the one that you're left with has to be true. These are valid forms of argumentation. They're valid implications from, uh, from the statements that we started with. Okay, so I'm gonna give you, some, uh, give you some examples. I wanted to show off my roommate here. And so uh, if you want to work through this example really quickly, write this sentence down. Um, Alala is friendly, stinky, and perfect. The question is, what could you uh, what could you learn from that statement? How could you break that statement down using the rule that we had on the previous slide? Now, I'm going to show you, roommate, because she really loves dentist sticks. So I'm going to give her a dentist stick and so you can see her. But the sentence again is, Alala is friendly, stinky, and perfect. You can see her. <laughs> she knows. She knows that a dentist stick is coming. She would normally do tricks for us, but she looks pretty comfortable. So maybe I'll just have her hang out there. Oh, no, she's getting up. Down. Sit. Shake. Tippity. Yeah. Good girl. Okay. So, um, shameless promotion of my roommate. Uh, so if, if you were able to work through the example, what you should have done is formalized. You should have seen that there is a conjunction there. So it's an and, and this is a complex set of things joined by an and. All of the things have to be true for it to be a true statement with an and. So if this is a true statement, then what you can do is you can simplify out a lot of different things. From the sentence, Alala is friendly and stinky and perfect, you get 
she is friendly, she is stinky, she is perfect. So that's that's what's happening in a conjunction. This is probably pretty self-explanatory, but part of practice is that you sort of spend time with the examples to try and see how they work out. Okay, uh, disjunction. <laughs> you either die an Omega Rizzler or you live long enough to become Skibbity Ohio, right? You either die an Omega Rizzler or you live long enough to become Skibbity Ohio. This picture here is me with one of my best friends, uh, still one of my best friends to this day. This, uh, so I'm showing this because I, I love so much this picture. On, on the wall, that's, that's this is my freshman dorm wall at St. Edwards University in 2005 in Austin, Texas. Um, that is my roommate's art on the wall. So he was like a painter and did lots of, uh, did lots of art and stuff like that. And that is with, like I said, my best friend. For whatever reason, my mom got lightsabers for me. I don't even like Star Wars, but I think it's one of those things, moms being moms, you know, oh, you, you like science fiction, so you probably will like these. She was right. They they were pretty pretty cool and uh so my friend couldn't resist dueling lightsabers with me and, and stabbing me with them so um so yeah maybe it's interesting to you to see that your professors once were maybe a little bit like you probably nerdier probably a little bit stranger but this is me as a college freshman the sentence here you either die an omega rizzler or you live long enough to become skibbity ohio all right so with the disjunctive practice, the implication that we could use here potentially is we're looking here. Uh, you should have picked up on there being a disjunction here or an or that basically is setting up two options against against uh, what's going on here. All right. So um, bonus points if you notice that the either or formulation is probably an exclusive disjunction as, pro as opposed to an inclusive disjunction. Remember that inclusive disjunctions both could be true, um, but at least one has to be. Exclusive disjunctions means only one can be true. They both cannot be true. They're both opposites. So we would probably, we'd probably say that this is exclusive. I've, I've simplified over on the right though. So formalized. What this does in setting up two options is you probably either die an Omega Rizzler or you live uh, to become Skibbity Ohio, right? And then we would say, but not both to make it exclusive. Um, so two options. And then if we get further information that somehow eliminates one or the other, since we know that one has to be true, and since we've eliminated all of the other options, we know that whatever we're left with is the only thing that can be true. So you die an Omega Rizzler or you live uh, you live to become Skibbity Ohio. Well, I know that I didn't die an Omega Rizzler. <laughs> so I'm left with being Skibbity Ohio. That is the unfortunate truth. But uh, the fact that a 40 year old man is using this kind of vocabulary, I bet you suspected that conclusion anyway. So now let's move on to um, let's move on to conditionals and and I'm also I'm also just gonna give very quickly that board game metaphor a you hit a and then it goes to b right the antecedent is the if clause it's the first part it is the if that thing obtains that's kind of what happens and then that leads to the consequent or the then clause. The arrow only goes one way. So the, the example sentence here is, if my dog likes you, then I like you. My dog likes you is the antecedent. I like you is the consequent. Now, I also mentioned, and, and there's many other uh, problems with respect to translating natural language into formal language, which this logic is. I'm setting them aside because, again, this isn't a logic class. Um, but... But linguistically, at least in English, we can put the consequent before the antecedent. So it isn't always uh, literal linguistic order. You really have to pay attention to the conjunctions because I like you if my dog likes you has the consequent first and it has the antecedent second. Uh, but I know that because the if is there. Now, the second sentence, the reason why I bring it up is because uh, it flips the order um, at least linguistically, logically, we would still we would still write it the same way. And there's no then. There's no then in the formulation. So in English, you especially are going to pay attention to if. 
if is really, really important. And whatever clause the if is residing over or presiding over, whatever it's controlling, that's the antecedent. The then, even if it's not there, that is that is the, the consequent. Okay, so let's get an example. We used these for separating out probably the two most common ways of using a conditional, and that is modus ponens versus modus tollens. I have the graphic of the antecedent and consequent, again, just to remind us. But the interesting thing about ponens and tollens, and remember we had that phrase, one person's ponens is another person's tollens. They start out with the same exact conditional, okay? But what separates these two things from arriving at different conclusions is this second premise, because depending on what comes next, it depends on what you can get as a derivation of that. So modus ponens, if A, then B, second premise A, you can validly and logically deduce that you get B. Again, it's that board game metaphor. Uh, you're not saying that you land on A, but if you land on A, you automatically advance to B. Oh, premise two, we do land on A, so we know we automatically get to B. Modus ponens, I think that one's really intuitive. You probably have a grasp of that. Modus tollens is where it gets a little bit complicated, and I'm going to try something out as an explanation. If it's confusing, I guess you just kind of have to maybe think about it yourself or try and get it to work or just brute, like outright memorize it. But if A, then B, so the same sort of conditional, not B, so not A. This is a valid conclusion. So as I said, the conditionals, the arrow only goes one way. We're not putting in by conditionals. There's there's these special operators that you can get, okay? Um, but again, this isn't a logic class. Uh, if A, then B. Not B, meaning you don't get this. So you don't get what automatically would have led to that. That just doesn't happen. So what I'm going to say, and this is what I'm going to try out here, it, just to give you a different way. If it's confusing, forget what I'm about to say. But in order to go, go backwards against that arrow that you're not supposed to go against, notice that we've added two negations here. Not B gets us not A. So something about the negation, I'm going to say, is what lets you kind of like go backward on the modus tollens. Uh, now, that, that might be a little bit confusing if you just want to think of the, the, the conditional as going one direction, but... Uh, if, if it's really confusing, just kind of memorize the formula, okay? So that's that's the that's the the quick recap of that. The previous video also talks about this. So let's try some practice. Keeping in mind that I just said uh, Omega Rizzler and Skibbity Ohio, um, let's take this conditional. If Dr. T keeps using cringe examples, his students will hate him, okay? And as I said, with modus ponens and modus, modus tollens, you can use the same conditional, but the second premise is going to have to be different to deduce a third valid conclusion, right? A third premise, which is which is the conclusion. So if you want to try these examples, pause the video here, try to guess what the second premise would be to get a third premise, which is the conclusion, and a valid modus ponens and a valus, mo, valid modus tollens, okay? So... I'm going to reveal the answer right now. Okay. So, same conditional. If Dr. T keeps using cringe examples, his students will hate him. For the modus ponens, you get the antecedent. You get the first part. You get the A. Dr. T keeps using cringe examples. So, as a valid conclusion, you get the B. Because you got this first part. That automatically leads to the second part. So, you know his students hate him. All right, so this is a valid argument. This uh, number three, which is the conclusion, necessarily follows from number one and number two. That's what it means. Validity just means that the conclusion necessarily follows. Then we could evaluate for soundness because we found that it's a valid argument, and then we could test each premise to see whether it's true, and if they are true, then it's also a sound argument. Now, uh, there might be one of you out there who doesn't hate me, in which case you could say that this is a valid argument, but not a sound argument. So we can judge the form apart from judging the content of the argument. We can judge the validity, the formal aspect, without judging the soundness or the, the, uh, the meat, the substance of every single premise and whether it's actually true. Okay, so if A, then B, A, B. 
Modus Stolens, okay. If Dr. T keeps using cringe examples, his students will hate him. But then we find out that his students don't hate him. What would validly be deduced then is he didn't keep using cringe examples, okay. So again, Modus Stolens, you have the A leading to B, and then you say not B, therefore not A. You have two negations, okay? You have two negations because you don't get the consequent, you do not get the antecedent. That's what happens in modus tollens. All right. Now, I want to very quickly go over the fallacies because the fallacies, like I said, these are tricky because they look very, very similar to modus ponens. They look very, very similar to modus tollens. So it's worth it's worth uh, just just repeating these as potential examples that can help us out here. Affirming the consequent mimics modus ponens. So we use the same same conditional. If Dr. T keeps using cringe examples, his students will hate him. Premise two, his students hate him. Okay. Now, if we wanted to be completely above board, we would just stop there. We cannot combine premise one and premise two here to get any new information. That's just, that just can't happen with respect to the logic here. But the fallacy would be to try to deduce that he's using cringe examples. So what this basically says is if A, then B, we get B, fallacy, so we get A. But the problem is we're going the wrong direction on the conditional. The conditionals go A arrow B, right? If, then. Uh, what this is trying to do is saying B back to A, and that's that's not how stuff works okay so what i've put down here as an explanation is modus ponens only goes from left to right from the antecedent to the consequent think of that that board game metaphor uh you hit the a space and it automatically advances to b all right that's that's kind of that's how i would think about it you hit the a space uh you automatically advance to b um but but affirming the consequent makes it go the other direction and that's why it's invalid that's why it's invalid it's not a good thing i've put it in red here and struck it out just to make it very very clear okay with denying the antecedent this is meant to look like modus tollens because they're using negations here and there's two negations in the second premise and in the conclusion just like modus tollens so if we say if dr t keeps using cringe examples his students will hate him but we say Dr. T doesn't keep using cringe examples. Now, what we should do is just stop there. Like I said, it would be completely okay to just stop there. We aren't making any implications there because no good implications can be made by combining one and two. But denying the antecedent, mimicking modus tollens, it's gonna say, um, because you get not A, then you get not B. So because Dr. T doesn't keep using uh, cringe examples, then his students don't hate him. Now remember that with modus tollens, you have the negations, and I'm just piloting, piloting this, so try it out. If it's confusing, like I said, just, just memorize it. But you have to have the neg negations to go the other way. It doesn't let you use the conditional like a normal conditional though, okay? So I have a feeling that if there's confusion, it's just modus tollens and then the denying the antecedent. Um, ask me questions in the comments, ask me questions in, in class or something like that. But uh, it, it might just come down to maybe memorizing the rules. I know that's really unsatisfactory, um, but at the level that, that we're engaging, uh, I, I don't wanna go deep into theory to kind of explain this stuff. We could use truth tables or or other other rules of implications or something like that to to talk about this, but I'm but I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible. I'm happy to talk about it in person though. So come see me in office hours or whatever else and we can work through as many examples as you want. All right. Now, uh, very quickly, because I'm trying to keep this video relatively short, um, I want to show you a couple of examples because the, these logical forms are everywhere. And one of one of the philosophers who I know the best and one of the philosophers who is one of my biggest um, inspirations is Aristotle. Aristotle writes a lot of really important stuff on ethics and politics. And in particular, he has a very, very famous dilemma, or technically this would be a trilemma because there's three options here where he says uh, in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics, which is kind of his, his uh, greatest work, um, he says the best life, so he's trying to figure out what life humans should lead, consists in the life of pleasure, the life of honor, or the life of intellectual activity. 
Now, side note, he actually does mention that there's maybe some other options, but traditionally, it's seen as three lives uh, that he sets out as kind of like the most important things. Notice he's using an or here and he's setting up three options. So it's a life of pleasure where we're just trying to pursue bodily stuff. And the Greeks meant stuff like drinking wine, having sex with people, eating good food, the life of bodily pleasure. That's, that's what, that's one particular option. Second option is a life of honor. So we pay attention to our reputation. We try to pursue goods that get us good reputation, etc. And then three, the life of intellectual activity, which uh, life of philosophy, life of other stuff, maybe music, maybe art, um, but definitely, definitely philosophy. And he's saying between those three, those are the three options. So if we eliminate, you know, any of those options, then uh, then we kind of like ended up and the structure of the Nicomachean ethics is such that it's probably the case that it's not the life of pleasure, probably the case that it's not the life of honor. So it's probably the life of intellectual activity, not really, not really clear, but he does try to set out at least basically a little bit of a dilemma slash trilemma here. Now, one of the reasons why I'm bringing this up is also because I, the, the whole point of doing critical thinking is so that whenever we run into these arguments in real life, we, we know what to do with them. We know the logical, we know the logical uh, underpinnings, okay? So someone is setting up options. They're trying to use process of elimination to leave you with one. But that only works if, and this is the first bullet point here, there aren't other options. So one of the questions we should ask is, are there other options here? Uh, and then the second point, are there hybrids maybe? So one of the things, one of the things that you could ask in order for this dilemma or trilemma or quadrilemma or whatever, how many other options you have, you need to have every single option to do that process of elimination. If you leave out options, either because you're ignorant, that's the best case scenario, uh, or because you're just outright deceptive and you're a rascal and you're a rapscallion and you're trying to make your most plausible thing look more plausible because you only put it next to dumb examples, um, that, that, is, that is a logical form that a lot of people will really use. This, the last thing that we should ask, and uh, I'll stop this slide on that, is we can always consider whether we should change the logical connective here. And in particular, should this be and? So if we were to make this, the best life consists in a life of pleasure, a life of honor, and a life of intellectual activity. What that would mean is the best life includes somatic pleasures, the best life includes reputation and the goods of reputation, and the best life includes uh, intellectual pursuits. Okay, now that does uh, something different to the argument in the sense that it sets the bar super high. You need to be you need to be hitting in all areas of life, doing really well in all areas of life. Nonetheless, maybe that's what you do think is going on. So just be mindful of the connective. And remember from the previous lecture that um, the and slash or choice is what allowed for the legal confusion surrounding the case of Jahai McMath to be pronounced dead in California because the doctors felt that she sustained enough uh, irreversible brain damage, but living on the East Coast because they found a state where uh, because she still had um, cardiopulmonary function due to her brainstem probably still working, uh, that she was technically alive on the East Coast. Law should not be one of those things that says that technically you're dead in one state while technically alive in another state. That seems to be a really strange result. And that's all because of the logical connective that they're using in those particular pieces of legislation. So minding your ands, minding your ors, ands, both sides have to be true, ors, at least one has to be true, okay? So th these things have real implications for uh, writing legislation or writing laws. Okay, and I'll give you one quick example of a conditional from the history of philosophy. And um, this is especially thinking about necessary conditions. So I mentioned very quickly that in an if-then clause, the if clause is a sufficient con condition, the then clause is a necessary condition, meaning you need it for the other thing. So I think that this sh this sentence kind of shows this. Now, if this if that's, if that, mentioning of necessary and sufficient conditions is confusing to you, you can forget that. 
All you need to do is focus on the if then sentence uh, that's right here. So the example sentence is if you're flourishing. So for Aristotle, flourishing is living the best kind of life, the best human life. You've developed your capacities. You've balanced all the goods of life. That is the kind of life that humans want to live. If you're flourishing, then you have friends. If you're flourishing, then you have friends. So we have as the antecedent, you are flourishing. We have as the consequent, you have friends, all right? And I think that modus tollens is probably what's really interesting here because basically we could rephrase that as if you don't have friends, so we, we negate the consequent, then that means that you are not flourishing. We negate the antecedent. So normally it goes A to B, but modus tollens says not B to not A. So it kind of reverses things through negation. And that makes sense. This says, if you are flourishing, then you have friends. So if you're living that good life, you have friends. The inverse of that is without friends, you are not flourishing. Both of those are saying basically the same thing. And you can derive them in certain systems of logic. Again, I'm kind of skipping that here, but this is why modus ponens and modus tollens kind of, kind of go hand in hand in, in, in certain ways, okay? But if we're evaluating something like this conditional, if you are flourishing, then you have friends. One of the things that we could, we could ask whenever we're trying to be critical thinkers is, uh, if we want to keep the conditional, would we switch it? So would we say instead, if you have friends, then you're flourishing? So then having friends becomes the sufficient condition for flourishing. And flourishing becomes a maybe necessary condition for having friends. I don't know if we want that implication, but certainly whenever you're setting up a conditional, you should probably make sense that you have the two clauses in the right order. Because as I said, that clause, that arrow, it only goes in one direction. I apologize I've been pointing, if I've been pointing in the wrong direction, because uh, the camera is flipped where, where I'm recording this, okay? But secondly, as I said, if we're connecting A and B, we could use other logical connectives. We don't have to use if then, we could use and, we could use or, okay? And so one of the things that we could do is we could just deny that there's any connection at all between flourishing and having friends. Maybe those two things are completely independent, okay? Uh, maybe if you're a really cynical, uh, anti, anti sort of social kind of person, and there are these kinds of people, some of my favorite people are like this, maybe they would even put an exclusive or between those two things. It's either be a flourishing person or have friends, but not both, okay? Uh, so you can change that logical connective between those two ideas, and it's gonna change the way that we read it, the way that we understand it, the way that we would derive further information from that. So that's, that's, uh, those are some further examples. Hopefully that helps to clarify um, how these logical connectives are used. Hopefully the examples kind of help. And I'm gonna close, although not tightly related with, with, uh, with what we're talking about, with a short logic joke. And it is this. Three logicians walk into a bar. The bartender asks, do you all want a drink? The first logician says, uh, I don't know. Second logician says, I don't know. Third logician says, yes. And then the bartender gives them all three a drink. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this makes sense, but I guess I'll explain it because everyone knows that jokes get funnier the more that you explain them. So what does this mean? The bartender asks, do you all want a drink? The first logician, if the logician had known that they themselves didn't want a drink, then the logician could have said, uh, no, but the logician did want a drink, but it didn't know if um, the other two logicians wanted a drink. So the second logician, picking up on this, uh, knows that logician one wants the drink because they, they hesitated. Uh, they probably want a drink because if they didn't want a drink, they would just say no and it would stop the question. But they don't know about the third logician. Then the third logician, picking up on the opinions of the other two people, realizing that those two wanted a drink because if they hadn't, they would have said no, right? Because they're one of the all. Uh, they know that the first two logicians wanted a drink. They themselves want a drink. So the third logician can say, yes, I want a drink, or yes, we do indeed all want drinks. Um, so I think what you're finding here is that logic can be a really great catalyst for a stand-up comedy career. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for meeting uh, my roommate, Alala. 
and hopefully these examples help out. If they are not clear, like I said, comments, office hours, whatever else that I can do to help you. Have a good night.